Paul Huber here from Kittery Point. I just wanted to talk a little bit about spiritual influence. I know last week Bruce had talked about how the kingdom of God is like a giant net and how it catches both good and bad fish and how we are supposed to be like that net going out into our communities and having spiritual influence bringing people to Christ. Um, when I think of spiritual influence, I think about the story of Elisha found in 2 Kings 6. So a little background is the king of Aram comes up against Israel and he tries to conquer it, but the king of Israel always seems to be one step ahead of him. He starts wondering if there's spies in his court, but eventually his advisors tell him, well, no, actually there's a prophet who's telling the king of Israel what's going to happen before it happens. So he says, well, let's take out this threat. Let's send a great army to wipe out this prophet. And let's pick up in verse 15, where it says, when the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army of horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, O Lord, open his eyes so he may see. Then the Lord opened his servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. So I think the first thing Elisha is aware of is that he's in a spiritual battle. Even though there's an intimidating physical army in front of him, he knows that the battle's spiritual. And I think he knows his side has the most power. And I think for us, that is just as true. Sometimes having spiritual influence can be something that's really intimidating. But we need to know that we have the power of God on our side. The power of an almighty, all-powerful God is behind us. Second of all, Elisha says, I need to pray. And I think if we're going to have any kind of spiritual influence, we need to pray that our eyes are open. That our eyes are open to situations that are around us, to people who are in need and what those needs are. Um, and thirdly, Elisha's servant is in a great situation here because he's under Elisha. And Elisha can be someone who encourages him and who directs him in the way that he needs to go. And for us, I think exerting spiritual influence isn't something that necessarily comes naturally. Sometimes we need somebody who's there, who knows more than us, who can answer difficult questions we have that we come across. Or maybe we need somebody who can encourage us when we're feeling discouraged, when we feel like we're not making as much progress as we need to. So I think when we're focusing on how can we have a good influence on the people around us, I think three factors are really key. One is that we are in a spiritual battle. The second is that we need to pray for and ask for God's help and ask that God will show us the situations that are in front of us and give us the right words to say or not say. And finally, we need to find a mentor that can encourage us and guide us um, and coach us in being an influence to a dark world. Good morning. That was a great word from Paul. Um, appreciate Paul's hard work at our Kittery uh, Point campus and um, just the way he's in, been engaged as part of a team and uh, helping, you know, really feed into the lives of many of our young people there. That's good advice um, on how we might just uh, begin to increase the influence that God has given us in the world in which we find ourselves. I am um, thinking about that kind of influence. I um, wonder if you might remember a, a man by the name of uh, Rod Cooper. Uh, Rod Cooper um, is a, just a, a great preacher. Um, years ago, he came as part of a team with um, uh, Iron Sharpens Iron, and he spoke on a weekend, and then we had him here uh, speaking uh, during one of our Sunday services. Those who have heard uh, Dr. Rod Cooper understand he's a, he's a great communicator of the word, a lot of energy. And um, I was listening to a sermon that he had uh, given a while back. And in the midst of that sermon, he shared this little story. And I, I'd like to read it to you because it does have to speak about influence and encouragement. And um, listen to these words. He says, I'm strong on this quality of encouragement because someone got excited about my progress. I almost flunked the first grade. I was a terrible reader. We had three reading groups in my school. The highest group was called the Owls. They were in the trees above everybody else. Uh, the next group happened to be the Giraffes, and they were head and shoulders above the rest of us. I, well, he says, I was in the third group, the Humpty Dumpties. <laughs> we were on the wall, off the world, in the world. <laughs> we just couldn't get it together, and we struggled. 
My mom saw me coming home discouraged and down every day. And so she started reading with me every night. I came home one day with a C on one of my papers and I gave it to her. And she smiled and started to cry. She said, oh, Rodney, I'm so proud of you. And she made my favorite dinner and let me stay up a little later that day. And I'm thinking, gee, <laughs> if this is what a C will do, what do you think that did for me? He said, it spurred me on to want to do my best. And that's what encouragement does. It makes you want to move on when you feel like quitting. I didn't make it to the owls. I, I got to the giraffes and I got out of the first grade. And here I am. Today, my mom introduces me. This is my son. And she puts her on me and, and, uh, and says, this is my son, Dr. Cooper. And then she'll look at me with a twinkle in her eye and wink just to remind me where I've come from. We all need that kind of encouragement. I, I think over these past couple of weeks as we've been engaged in this study of welcome to my world, Jesus has been doing that for you and me. He's been giving us some insight in what the kingdom of God is like so that as we find ourselves en enmeshed in a world that sometimes is less than the ideal, we don't lose hope because he has given us some insight in what it means to be living in this kingdom on earth. And I, I think the treasure that he tells us we are to glean from the world around us was meant to bring that level of encouragement. But sometimes we can still find ourselves prone to discouragement, right? Partly because I think it's what the Apostle Paul says in the in the uh, second letter to the Corinthian church where he writes that we have this treasure in vessels of clay, right? We, we have this tremendous treasure that God placed, but it's, it's still a part of this broken humanity. And it's kind of hard to see how it all fits together. Paul understood that. He would write in uh, this same chapter, he says, uh, he knows what it's like to be hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. See, Paul under understands that what, what, it, what it's going to take to live life on this side of eternity. He adds that though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary afflictions are achieving for us an eternal weight that far outweighs them all, so that we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporal, but what is unseen is eternal. That's why Jesus comes along and he begins to pull back the curtain so that we get a, uh, a fuller understanding of what he is what he's seeking to accomplish, not only in us, but in the world at large. And so Paul, as, a, um, as an apostle, is, is out trying to communicate this same message that Jesus has, um, has delivered. And Paul answers a question that I think confronts us every day that we live in this world. A, a question that it has to be addressed if we are... Uh, if we're to not lose heart. It's a question that I put in your notes that how are we to live then between two worlds? How do we live in this world and um, with an eye towards the one to come? We are firmly rooted in this world and yet God is calling us to set our minds and our affections on things above. And so how do we do that? How do we take this treasure in this earthen vessel and still wind up making progress so that everything that Jesus told us about the kingdom of heaven on earth, we begin to realize more and more in our life. And so in your sermon notes today, I placed this passage from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And uh, Paul is going to develop this theme. And um, I'd like to read uh, a number of these verses for you. It's in... Uh, Chapter 5, beginning of verse 1, he says, Now we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, 
an eternal house in heaven not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. For while we are in this tent, we groan in our burden because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now it is God who has made us for this very purpose and has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. We live by faith, not by by sight. See, one of the ways in which we find ourselves living in this world with an eye towards heaven is Paul, I believe here, is telling us that we have to focus on the promise. There are a number of things that he says in our text. Look, for instance, he says, we know that if the earthly tent that we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Well, if you're going to focus on the promise, then you're going to have to learn how to embrace your present reality. And part of the embracing of our present reality is recognizing that as long as we are still at home in this body, then we are prone to all of the signs of the brokenness of the world around us, as well as the fact that it's going to be a a bit of a... uh, Uh, of a challenge. That's why he says here, he says, we groan. Why? Because you, you are, we're longing to be clothed with this heavenly dwelling. We want to put off this, you know, the confines of a world that is broken on so many levels. And we want to be clothed with this heavenly dwelling because when that occurs, the old is going to pass away and all things are going to be made new. Another part of this present reality, he says, is that we groan, but we are also burdened. We're waiting for what is mortal to be swallowed up by life. There is this sense that it's not right, that things are, they, they, they were meant to be so much better. And life in this world is, is filled with groaning and the sense of burden. But what else do we read in this text? Do you notice that it says, God made us for this very purpose. God made us for the purpose that one day this mortality will be consumed by immortality. What is temporal will become eternal. What is corruptible will become incorruptible. He says, I made you for this very purpose. And so what does he do? He gives us the spirit. His Holy Spirit, a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. He says, this spirit that I have caused to dwell in you is the gift that my Father has given to you. This Holy Spirit in us is a guarantee, he says, of what is to come. And while we are separated from the Lord in, in his physical presence at this moment, he says, we are called upon to live by faith and not by sight. So in other words, you got to focus on the promises. you got to focus on all that God says, I'm going to do. Which means that we have to recall what, what his purpose is for us. And you see glimpses of that here, right? That God's saying, look, I have a better world for you. I, I have a better future for you. That this tent is one day going to be exchanged for an eternal house that God says, I am built with my own hands for you, this spiritual body. And if we had just a moment to reflect just on that one truth alone and how much is, um, comes upon us because of the afflictions of this flesh or living in this world that's just filled with so much you know, trouble, you begin to understand, man, this is going to be so much better. And because we were made for this, right? We were made for eternity. We, we were made for this purpose that he says that the mortal will be swallowed up by life. So how do you live between this world and the world to come? It's only going to be possible if we begin to start focusing on the truth. And when we do, we realize that God then is welcoming us into his world. He's telling us what is, 
what is going to, to be, but he's also showing us the limitations of what we can expect in this world. And yet he doesn't leave us, you know, um, alone. He provides us with a spirit that he says is a guarantee of what is to come. Uh, but there's more in our text. Look at uh, verses 9 and 10. He says, so we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Over the past few weeks, we have talked about that great day coming when God says he is going to, if you remember the parable of the wheat and the weeds, and he says there's going to be this day of harvesting, right? The weeds are going to be gathered and burned, and the wheat are going to be brought into the barn. Or the, the parable of the net where he says he's going to, uh, we as the children of this kingdom of heaven, we're being tossed out into this lake and we're going to gather all the fish, but it's God who's going to be the one who's going to separate the good from the bad, the righteous from the wicked. That's a, it's a terrible day of judgment. But you notice in this text here, it's saying that um, we make it our goal to please him, that there is this judgment seat of Christ that we're all going to stand before and we're going to receive what is due him for the things done while in this body, whether good or bad. I, I, I look at this and I, I, the words I put to it is that we have to adopt a new game plan. The way in which we live in this world, we're in this earthly tent. We have been given the Spirit of God who reminds us of the things that are to come. We are in a world that is demonstrating its fallenness, the depravity that we find all around us and sometimes, quite frankly, in us. And God says, I want you to focus on these promises. I want you to focus on what is to come. But it's going to take you and me adopting a new game plan. It's not about me going out into the world and just doing my own thing. Now, because I have been made aware of what God is promising on my behalf, He's telling me that I, have a, I should have a different goal in my life. My goal is to please him. My, my goal is while I am still in this flesh, as well as when I am now clothed with this heavenly body that he has made for me, I am going to find myself now giving myself over and over to serving him, to pleasing him. And we're going to, we understand why that is, right? Because the one who is calling for this sense of, of love and loyalty is the one who has demonstrated it first. God loved us first. While men were still sinners, Christ died for them. So that you and I now are serving one who already gave all he had, that he might bring us back into fellowship with himself. And we're going to see that more in this text as we go. But for now, this game plan, it fits on earth and it's going to fit in heaven. The goal is to please him, to know him. And standing before the judgment seat of Christ isn't that same great day of judgment when your eternity is in the balance. Here it says now we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ to receive what was done in the body, whether good or bad. It's, it's not a, a judgment that um, removes us from the presence of, of, of God, but it's one in which God says, we're going to test your works and see if they were wood, hay, and stubble, or refine them as if they were gold and silver. So now you're going you're to find yourself in a position where you're going to receive your due. How about if you started living like that? How about if you wake up every morning with the idea that your life now is open before the eyes of the one to whom one day we will give an account. That every day you wake up, the way in which you engage your family, your neighbors, your, your workplace, the way in which you engage the world around you is a testimony to whether or not the goal of your life is to please him. How about if the motivations that, that moved you at the core of your very being 
was that one day I'm going to stand before the judgment seat of Jesus and I am going to receive in that moment what is due. How does that make you feel? See, now you understand why I'm talking about adopting a new game plan. If I'm going to live on earth as we will live in heaven, then God's saying, no, no, then you have to have a different focus. You have to, you have to focus on my, my, my promises, but you're also going to have to adopt this new game plan. You're going to have to go about living life differently. You're serving a different master now, and you can't serve both. You, 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 you just can't. Your heart will be divided. Jesus says, where your treasure is there, you'll find your heart. The kingdom of heaven, it said, was like that pearl of great price, right? That hidden treasure that we sold all that we have because we saw the value of this was worth everything that I have. And that will be made so perfectly plain when this earthly tent is done away and now we stand in the presence of God and in that moment you're going to have to think back and think, oh my gosh, like, did I take advantage of the opportunities that were afforded me? Was I a good witness? Did I live the kind of life that he, that he called me to? Now, I, granted, we're, we're not perfect. Nobody's, nobody's ever, you know, here at Bethany Church, you know, um, talking about some levels of perfection that we can ever achieve. God understands that this is a vessel of clay, right? But that's not an excuse to try, not to try harder, not to make sure that our, our, our affections are in the right place, that we are motivated with the, with the right, you know, uh, goal in mind. And so that's why when we think about Paul who says, look, I, I understand that this outer man is the king, but this inner man is being renewed day by day because I understand that the momentary light afflictions that I'm experiencing cannot be compared to this eternal weight of glory. So I am choosing to see what others refuse to see. And that's how you live in this world while we're waiting for the next. We have a different game plan. We wake up with a different, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, different ambitions. But there's even more in this text. In 2 Corinthians 5, I want you to, I'm going to read it to you, and then we're going to break this down a little bit. He says, since then we know what it is to fear the Lord. Yeah, we know what it's like to fear the Lord because now this idea of pleasing him, of showing reverence and loyalty, we, we know what that's like. And we also are reminded that one day we're going to stand before the very presence of him who will judge all of our work. So Paul understands, he says, look, I, we know what it's like to fear the Lord. And so as a result of that, we try to persuade men. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. And all this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. And so we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. There's a lot of good things that are being taught in this passage. And when we, when we open it up, 
in the light of this question about how do we live between this world and the one to come, he has some very interesting things. And I think, first of all, we ought to put down on this list that he's calling us to live as Christ's ambassador. And, and what does that mean? An ambassador, right? It comes with the authority of one. It, it, it comes representing the sender. So we are ambassadors of Christ. We are here to represent him to the world at large. Paul took that role seriously. And so have generations of believers since. So let's just look at a few of these texts here. And what I want you to capture, first of all, is that Paul is inspired by Christ's love. He goes, because he, understood, he understands that one day, well, because he understands that he, is, he has been placed here and his goal is to please Jesus. He understands that one day he's going to stand before him and give an account. When he also understands that Christ died for him, that his sins are no longer reckoned against him, that whatever it was that took place in his life, God says, look, I want to come and I want to redeem you. I want to reconcile you to me. And he sends his son as a ransom to pay this price so that you and I can be set free from the burden associated with our sin so that you and I are pronounced forgiven. Paul now says, because of all that he has done, he goes and he says, look, we try to persuade men now. Because he wants them to experience the same thing that he's experienced. Inspired by Christ's love, he understands that there was this substitutionary death that brought him life. And this life that he has, while it comes with the promise of all that is good and all that is eternal, he also recognizes that this life is not just about him. Do you catch that in this text? Look at here, verse 15. He says that Christ died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves but rather for him who died for them and was raised again. So it just underscores this love of Jesus again, that he came and paid this price for your sin. And by his resurrection, he demonstrates that he has the power over death. Mankind's most notorious enemy. There's not one who enters into this world and, and is embitten by this sting. Our mortality just underscores again that there is so much time. And whatever we do between the days of our birth and the days of our, of our death, there's nothing in here that could ever stop this one reality. And yet God sends his son, Jesus, who dies the penalty for our sins so that our sins would not be reckoned against us. But he gives us a righteousness that is not our own, but one that he has purchased. And that's, as we looked before, it says God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. And so if we have received this new life, if we know what now what it's like to be forgiven, to be given a, a, a new opportunity to go and engage the world in a way that has its goal to please him, then you have a different game plan now. Your, your life is going to take a different direction. And all of which because you have been inspired by this love that Jesus has demonstrated for you. So as we live as Christ's ambassador, it's because our hearts are full. But look at verse 16 and 17. 
It says, so from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. Isn't that one of the greatest promises in the Bible? You ever wish that you could do life over? Did you ever wish that somehow or another life came with this eraser? And whatever the mess is that we've made, we're able to just erase it away? And we recognize that there are consequences of sin. But sometimes in our desperation to be able to come to one who says, no, 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 I love you, and I am not going to allow these sins to define you. I'm going to, I'm going to make you over. This is going to be a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. The only one that can do that is the God who gives us life and breath. The creator of all that we see and all that we are. And so you read a text like this and you recognize that now my life is being informed by this entirely eternal perspective. That's why Paul says we don't look at anyone anymore from a worldly point of view. Why? Because a worldly point of view is a, is a point of view that is capturing everything about this world. And in this world, it's hard to find reconciliation. It's, it's hard to find forgiveness. It's hard to see the fruit of the, of the sinful flesh being let go. Everywhere you turn around, there is this hurt and this sorrow and this pain. And we might try to insulate ourselves from the world around us, but it is so insipid, it finds its way in. And there is none, none of us who are exempt. Whether it comes in, a, in an economic downfall or physical health or just the burdens of having to live with poor decisions. But Paul says, we don't look at people like that anymore. We used to look at Jesus like that. We used to think Paul, he understood, right? Because he considered Jesus what? This um, insurgent, this, this one who was causing trouble, the one whose, whose uh, very movement needed to be suppressed until Paul met Jesus. And then his life turned around and the one who was out persecuting the very church that Jesus died for is now its servant. And the Apostle Paul now, despite all of the trials that he faces in this life, he says he counts it but joy to know Jesus. His life has changed forever. He is sold out as an ambassador for Christ because he's been informed now of this eternal perspective. That's what God has for you. If you're in Jesus, you're a new creation. The old is gone, all things are new. And that's a perspective that we bring to the world. And that's a perspective that it so desperately needs. Let's go on as we finish in this text. Look at verse 18. It says, all this is from God who reconciled us, who gave us this ministry of reconciliation, and who has committed to us the message of this reconciliation. We are Christ's ambassadors. Paul is out here tirelessly fulfilling the mission. Think about that. God not only reconciles us to himself through the work of Jesus, but then he says, I want to give you this work this ministry of reconciliation. We're going out into the world and by the message of Jesus, we're helping to reconcile brother with brother and sister with, with sister to, to bring about a, a sense of wholeness in a community, demonstrating to people that there is another way to live. There is this forgiveness that Christ offers, this promise of reconciliation. And that's the message that we have. That's the message that changes the world. That's the, that's the message that can break down barriers that divide us. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. 
so that we might become the righteousness of God. That's the work that God does. And that's what's going to have to happen if we're going to live in this world as we also have set our hearts and affection on things above. Living between these two worlds, God's saying, look, I want you to focus on my promise. I, I, I want you to just... <laughs> I, I, I want you to just have a, a different game plan, right? I want you to adopt a different, a different game plan. And I, and I want you to live as though you were my ambassador. There is a, um, a Bible commentator by the name of William Barclay. He writes this. He says, there is one eternal principle with which, which will be valid as long as the world lasts. The principle is... Forgiveness is a costly thing. Human forgiveness is costly. A son or a daughter may go wrong. A father or a mother may forgive. But that forgiveness has brought tears. There was the price of a broken heart to pay. And we all know that, don't we? This sense of reconciliation, it doesn't come without its cost. As you have been reconciled to God, as God has looked in your life and, and, and brought this sense of freedom, has redeemed you again with a renewed sense of purpose, you can't help but now recognize that what you are experiencing, you want to see others experience. This is the world that God is calling us to. In his world, is it's a world where everyone prospers, where all of us now are at peace with one another and with him. Why would we not work so diligently to see this come to pass? That's why Mr. Barclay goes on and says, divine forgiveness is also costly. God is love, but God is holiness. God at least, le God least of all can break the great moral laws on which the universe is built. Sin must have its punishment or the very structure of life disintegrates. And God alone can pay the terrible price that is necessary before men can be forgiven. Forgiveness is never a case of saying, it's all right, it doesn't matter. No, forgiveness is the most costly thing in the world. When Jesus welcomes you into his world, it's because he has paid the price for your redemption. And then he welcomes you into his world and he says, I want you to live now as one day we will live in heaven. I want you to focus in on these promises I have for you. Don't let them go. They are your treasure. Remind yourselves of these things daily. Adopt a new plan so that your life now has meaning and purpose. God has called you in whatever profession that you're in. No matter where those circles are that you travel, you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. You are an ambassador for Jesus. And in that role, you're fulfilling not only this ministry of reconciliation, but you're bringing along with you the message of reconciliation. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That in his dying, he paid the penalty for our sin. And in his resurrection, he gives us new life. And a life that will one day take off this earthly tent and live with him in glory. The invitation is given to us in this world and it's received in the world to come. God is calling you and me into that world. That's how you live on earth as we look to heaven. Let's pray. Father, these words again are worthy of our reflection, if we truly understand 
what it is that you're communicating. It's a game changer. There is a reconciliation that takes place with the very one who made us. There's a settledness that comes into a life that now opens up doors of possibilities. We are no longer shackled, Lord, by the deeds of this flesh, but we have been set free. And in that freedom, Lord, you can't help but begin to look around and recognize that this message needs to be broadcast all over the world. People have to hear it. And what they do with it, Lord, it's on them. As you've told us in the fall, it's not our job to be concerned about the weeds or pulling them out. Our job is just to make certain, Lord, that we are being faithful to this calling that you have placed. So whether it's in our homes, in our, in our workplaces, in our schools, in our community, may people see us as men and women of integrity who have fixed their eyes on Jesus and who are running this race of faith with great endurance. I pray, Lord, that the, the love that you fill us with would pour out in those expressions of mercy and compassion and hospitality and that people would look and see that the only, the only reason perhaps that we are demonstrating such kindnesses is because you live in us. So I pray that for all my brothers and sisters. I pray, Lord, that we would not grow weary, that we would fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Because one day we will see and it will be glorious. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.